All right. Welcome, everybody. Happy Native American Heritage Month. Uh, and welcome to the final session of the Fall 2022 Decolonizing Sustainability Speaker Series. This semester, our theme is Centering Indigenous Knowledge in Ethical and Accountable Place-Based Learning. Uh, we have an absolutely excellent speaker to close out our series. I am thrilled uh, that Cal Poly Humboldt uh, gets to hear this presentation today uh, and think about this content uh, and how it will then inform our university's relationship with Indigenous nations uh, and how we engage in place-based learning. Uh, the speaker series has highlighted the role of Indigenous knowledge to place-based learning uh, by bringing in an array of experts uh, from fields that work with Indigenous peoples and place-based learning at their home institutions or their home nations. This is particularly relevant for us at Cal Poly Humboldt uh, as we seek to expand place-based learning communities for all of our incoming freshmen across our campus. Uh, it is our hope that this series provides inspiration to our campus community community as we develop and implement place-based learning communities that ethically engage uh, with Indigenous peoples, places, uh, and knowledges. Um, as always, we begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, folks are more than welcome to share whose ancestral territory they are joining us from today. Uh, if you are unsure whose ancestral territory you reside on, you can find that information out at the website I linked into the chat. Whoops, I should send it to everybody, not just our panelists. Uh, the website native-land.ca. And if you live in the United States, you can text the following phone number, 907-312-5085. You'll text your zip code and it'll let you know whose ancestral territory uh, you currently reside on. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with the politics of land acknowledgements, I really encourage folks to check out this lecture by Dr. Kutcha Risling Baldi titled, What Good is a Land Acknowledgement? Where she engages um, the shortcomings or performative nature that land acknowledgements without action right, uh, can perpetuate. Uh, so Cal Poly Humboldt, where uh, I'm joining us from today, occupies the unceded land of the Wiat peoples. This includes the Wiat tribe, the Bear River Rancheria, and the Blue Lake Rancheria. Gutdini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods, was renamed Arcata by settlers in 1860. But despite this, we ought peoples maintain connection to their territory through ceremony, culture, and stewardship. We ought peoples are central to both the history and the future right, of this place. Uh, and so uh, as uh, in our praxis of land acknowledgements, we like to provide uh, action items for folks to, to take up on um, in response to this land acknowledgement. Uh, I know I see a lot of students in the audience and I remember what it was like to be an undergraduate and not have a ton of money. So we have some free uh, action items for folks. Uh, so if you don't already, you can go follow the We Out Tribe on Facebook, keep updated on important events that are happening and moments wherein uh, the We Out Tribe can rely on the support right, of the community. Uh, if you haven't already, you can also follow the Native American Studies Department here at Cal Poly Humboldt via our Facebook, our Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Stay informed about opportunities to engage with Indigenous peoples and nations, and uh, stay informed on cool events uh, such as this one right, uh, that our department hosts. For all of you faculty and staff in the audience, uh, if you haven't done so already, you can pay the WIAT honor tax. The link is available to you in the chat. All of those proceeds go directly to the WIAT tribe. And our final action item uh, we'll provide today is you can donate to the Rue Dallager Food Sovereignty Lab and Traditional Ecological Knowledges Institute. The link is available to you uh, in the chat. I have a couple of housekeeping notes before I introduce our esteemed speaker. Uh, you will have an opportunity to ask questions of our speaker at the end of the session. So at the bottom of your Zoom window, you'll see a button that says Q&A. You'll click that button uh, and you will put your, uh, your question there. I will keep track of those um, and make sure uh, we get through as many of those questions as possible. If you're watching from Facebook, howdy. Uh, you're also welcome to put any comments or questions that you have as a comment on the video. Uh, and I will keep track of those uh, as well. So we're happy you're here. Hey, Facebook. Uh, second uh, housekeeping note, um, our session is currently being live streamed to Facebook. The recording will be available immediately following the session. 
Uh, we will also make uh, a recording available uh, on our YouTube channel. Uh, folks are more than welcome to use these uh, resources right in their classroom, in the syllabus, share with your friends, colleagues, uh, et cetera. So if you have to leave a little bit early or you're a little bit late, uh, you can access recordings and catch what you missed uh, following today's session. All right. I think those are all of my housekeeping notes. Uh, today's session is titled A Short History of the Blockade, Beavers, Diplomacy, and Regeneration in Nishnabewin. I am so excited to introduce our speaker, Dr. Leanne Badasmose Simpson. I'll share a brief bio for you, Dr. Simpson, but feel free to introduce yourself in your own way, however you see fit. Uh, Dr. Leanne Badasmose Simpson is a renowned Machisagik Nishnabek scholar, writer, and artist who has been widely recognized as one of the most compelling indigenous voices of her generation. Her work breaks open the intersections between politics, story, and song, bringing audiences into a rich and layered world of sound, light, and sovereign creativity. Working for two decades as an independent scholar using Nishnabek intellectual practices, Leanne has lectured and taught extensively at universities across Canada and the United States, and has 20 years experience with Indigenous land-based education. She holds a PhD from the University of Manitoba and teaches at the Deshinta Center for Research and Learning in Denede. Leanne is the author of eight books, including A Short History of the Blockade, the novel Nupaming, The Cure for White Ladies, which was shortlisted for the Governor General's Literary Award for Fiction and the Dublin Literary Prize. This accident of being lost was a finalist for the Rogers Writers Trust uh, Fiction Prize and the Trillium Book Award. Her new project, a collaboration with Robert Maynard, Rehearsals for Living, is a national bestseller and was shortlisted for the Governor General's Literary Award for Nonfiction. Leanne is also a musician. Her latest release, Theory of Ice, was named to the Polaris Prize shortlist, and she's the 2021 winner of the Prism Prize's Willie Dunn Award. I'll also share, Leanne, I read Landa's Pedagogy when I started graduate school and absolutely fell in love with your work. Uh, as we have always done is hands down one of my favorite books on the whole planet. Uh, I rely on it extensively in my own uh, manuscript uh, that I'm working on. And when I read that you've written eight books, I was like, um, that, wow, <laughs> I was, uh, I'm very impressed. Uh, and not to, to fangirl too much, I'll just share, you have been an absolutely huge inspiration to my own work, my own academic trajectory. Uh, and I'm so, so incredibly grateful that you've uh, agreed to present for our university today. So uh, thank you so much for being here. I'll turn the floor over to you. Uh, floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for, for all those kind words and um, for that for that beautiful, beautiful introduction. I really, really appreciate it. I think um, hearing, hearing Indigenous women and Indigenous queer folks and students connect with my work is really sort of the best thing ever for me. Um, and that, that means so much to me. So, Ani Kinuaya, Girigabajuna, Denawema, Kinigachia, Nishna, Begogaming, Nadonjaba, Nagonjawani, Megwadoda, Bidas Musake, Nadishnakaz. Um, I'm so grateful to be here visiting with you all today. I know that it's the end of the term at university, so it's a really stressful time. So my my heart goes out to to all of uh, all of the students and instructors on the Zoom today. Um, I know it's uh, I know it's stressful. But you're almost done. Um, and thank you so much to Caitlin for that um, that really action oriented um, land acknowledgments. There is a lot of great organizations and I can tell a lot of great work is being done in your community. And so that was that was a really beautiful way to start. So um, I'm Nichisagik Anishinaabek or Ojibwe and our territory is the North shore of Lake Ontario. I live roughly between the cities, the Canadian cities of Toronto and Ottawa. Um, we're the Eastern part of the, the Ojibwe or the Anishinaabe nation and, and that nation hugs kind of the Great Lakes and extends into Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. My particular understanding of life um, comes from this place. It comes from this Michisagi Kanishinaabe practice of living in deep relationality to the land, 
the waters, the plants, the animals, and all of the peoples that make up Kinagachi and Anishinaabek Ogaming, the place where we all live and work together. My homeland has taught me that Anishinaabe life is continual, reciprocal, and reflective. It's an engagement with my ancestors, those yet to be born, and the nations of being with whom I share land. It is a living constellation of coexistence with all of the anti-colonial peoples and the worlds they build. This land has taught me that Anishinaabe life is a persistent making process, despite of and in spite of the constant imposition of the colonial machinery of elimination. This procedure for Indigenous life and Indigenous living is one that my people used long before our existence ever depended upon our ability to resist and survive the violence of racial capitalism, heteropatriarchy, and expansive and recursive dispossession. My ancestors woke up each morning and they created Anishinaabe worlds. They animated their political systems of governance and diplomacy. They built their collective philosophical and ethical understandings. They made processes for solving conflicts and reestablishing balance. And they built their economy with the consent of plant and animal nations. They maintained and nurtured systems for sharing knowledge and for taking care of each other. They worked collectively to produce, reproduce, replicate, amplify, and share life as a continuous rebirth, because if they did not, Anishinaabe worlds would not exist. They were makers. They got up each morning and they worked hard, not the white man wage labor Monday to Friday, nine to five kind of work, not the kind of work where you outsource the labor of living so you can do something more important, but the kind of work that values above all else the way one lives. They got up, worked hard all day long in a way that brought forth more life. This algorithm of living, theory and praxis seamlessly intertwined and relationally responsive to one another is generated through intimate relations with Michisagik Nishnabek land, land that is constructed and defined by our intellectual, spiritual, emotional, and physical relationships with it. Living as a creative act, self-determination, consent, kindness, and freedom practiced daily in all of our relations, practices replicated over and over, making as the material basis for experiencing and influencing the world, living with the purpose of generating more life, our infrastructure for life was relationships, not institutions. Our orientation for life was internationalist. We shared space and time with plant and animal nations and different indigenous nations, mostly without the use of enclosures and violence. We didn't bank capital to protect us against hard times. We had interdependent relationships with other animal and plant nations and other human families in neighboring indigenous nations and in times of difficulty. We relied upon this practice of relational diplomacy and the worlds it creates to survive with the understanding that in return, we would also take care of their worlds. In March 2019, at the beginning of the pandemic, Canada was in the midst of a phenomenal expression of Indigenous international diplomacy as Indigenous peoples across Canada mobilized in solidarity with the Wasoatan hereditary chiefs from Northern British Columbia, Columbia and their clans in the form of rallies, round dances, teach-ins, benefit concerts, sit-ins, and of course, blockades, as they mobilized to protect their homelands from a construction of a pipeline. The Wasoatin hereditary chiefs have repeatedly stated that there is no access to their lands without their consent. And over the past two decades, they have done everything possible within the current structures to protect their lands. When the police invaded their territory to enforce a court injunction to make way for a 
the construction of the pipeline, they asked us for our support in protecting their land and their peoples from the coastal gas link pipeline. Canada has a long present and a long history of ignoring Indigenous consent when it comes to resource extraction on our territories, and they have always undermined our self-determination to decide what is best for our peoples and our lands. The Wasoatin hereditary chiefs were teaching the world a crucial message about consent. They've used the Canadian courts in the landmark Delegamuk decision. They've educated the public on speaking tours with videos, a website, camp tours, and they have built the alternative, a land immersive community with cabins, a pit house, bunk houses, and a healing center at the Onastadin camp, a camp built and maintained in the path of the proposed pipeline a camp that embodies a tremendous expression of life-giving Wasowitan law, politics, economy, and love, a Wasowitan world. Nearly three years have passed since the height of these solidarity blockades. Earlier this month, Molly Wickham shared that they have started drilling under the Wedzin Kwa River and issued an urgent call for solidarity actions on November 5th in opposition to the pipeline. None of the underlying issues have been addressed. And now we have pandemic upon the pandemics of anti-Blackness, colonialism, and a global climate catastrophe. So there will be more blockades in our future. There will be renewed actions to protect land and life for peoples that believe, as abolitionist thinker Ruthie Wilson Gilmore says, where life is precious, life is precious. Where all life is precious, all life is precious. Yellowknives Dene political theorist Glenn Colthard in a blog post entitled For Indigenous Nations to Live, Capitalism Must Die, posted during I Don't Know More, and we just had the 10 year anniversary of I Don't Know More, um, stated that the state has always placed limits on indigenous efforts to protect our lands. There are clear demarcations between moral and legitimate forms of defending our rights and morally illegitimate methods deemed so because of their disruptive or extra legal character. Legitimate forms of protecting our rights are usually negotiated between state sanctioned Aboriginal leadership and the crown, along with symbolic acts of peaceful and non-disruptive demonstrations sanctioned by Canadian law. Morally illegitimate tactics are forms of protest and direct action that are less mediated and sometimes more disruptive, like slowing traffic, temporary blockades, and the reoccupation of Indigenous lands through the establishment of reclamation sites that also serve to disrupt, if not entirely block, access to indigenous territories by state and capital for prolonged period of, periods of time. As Cothard writes, most often morally illegitimate activities get branded in the media in a negative manner as reactionary, threatening, dangerous, and disruptive. Indigenous blockades are a challenge to the dominant political and economic systems of Canada. They are an amplification and centering of Indigenous political economies, Indigenous forms of governance, economy, production, and exchange. They are, and indeed, a resurgence of social and political practices, ethics, and knowledge systems. In reality, behind the barricades, whether the blockades are enacted in Mauna Kea, on Dakota lands, at Standing Rock or at Unistodin, blockades are rich sites of world building. In the spaces behind the barricades, you'll find parents with children, you'll find elders, you'll encounter ceremony, sacred fires, and language learning, art making, singing, drumming, storytelling. You'll find an ethic of care as harvesters and cooks engage in a bush economy to feed the front lines alongside spiritual leaders, nurses and medics taking care of the people. You will notice a mobilized network of support and solidarity extending well beyond the barricades. You'll witness the reemergence of political leaders based not on a band council election, but on indigenous practices of deep relationality you will enter a collective embodiment of indigenous legal practices. 
you will hear the sound of political, intellectual, and spiritual engagement in these rich sites of knowledge production, and you'll see indigenous anti-colonial theory generated through embodied communal practice. You will witness a radically different political existence and ethical orientation in spite of the dominance of colonialism. Existences and orientations that are operating upon a different premise than the politics and economy of extraction. Living as a creative act, self-determination, consent, kindness, and freedom practiced daily in all our relations, practices replicated over and over, the practice of making as the material basis for experiencing and influencing the world, living with the purpose of generating continual life. Today, I want to step away from the usual ways blockades are portrayed in the media and understood by the majority of non-Indigenous peoples. I want to spend some time today thinking about this practice of blockade in a different way, in an Anishinaabe way. And I want to share the brilliance of my relative, the beaver. In Canadian colonial minds, the beaver is nature's engineer, the earliest forester, the first hydrologist, the original industry. No one has had more impact on the environment than beavers, except for humans, the saying goes. In 1975, the beaver became an emblem of Canada as a symbol of its sovereignty because the first Europeans in indigenous territories saw the beaver not as a relative, but as a money-making attraction to supply the continent with nifty felt hats. 200 years of making beavers into accessories led to their near extinction, and now beavers are mostly known as a nuisance and an inconvenience. But this indigenous land, this indigenous water, these indigenous bodies has centuries of oral literature and embodied practice that no different. In many versions of the Anishinaabe Seven Ancestors teachings, beavers, or in Anishinaabe Moan, Amik, and plural we say Amikwuk, represents Ni Bwakewin, the practice of wisdom. I want to think about that for a minute. Out of all of the beings that make up life on this planet, to my ancestors, Amikwuk, best embodied the politics and ethical practices of wisdom. Now there are some pretty cool features of the beaver and as a sporty person, I'm immediately attracted to the waterproof fur, the original Gore-Tex, web feet for efficiency in the pool, a third eyelid in the form of a nick dictating clear membrane that moves over their eyes and acts as swim goggles you cannot possibly lose. Orange and ever-growing teeth with iron in them are perfect for gnawing and not susceptible to yellow stains. Then I remember for the Anishinaabe, it is not necessarily our cool and sporty features that make us who we are. It is what we do and how we live into other in relation to other forms of life. Imikwuk built lodges, canals, and dams. And of course, the longest beaver dam in the world is located north of where you are and uh, north and west of where I am in 38 in Northern Alberta, and it measures 850 meters long. Beavers build dams, dams that create deep pools and channels that don't freeze, creating winter worlds for their fish relatives. Deep pools and channels that drought proof the landscape, dams that make wetlands full of moose deer and elk food, cooling stations, places to hide calves and muck to keep the flies away. Dams that open spaces in the canopy so sunlight increases, making warm and shallow aquatic habitat around the edges of the pond for amphibians and insects. Dams that create plunge pools on the downstream side for juvenile fish, gravel for spawning and homes and food for birds. And who is the first back after a fire to start the regeneration? Beavers. Amik is a world builder. Amik is the one that brings the water. Amik is the one that brings forth more life. This is the one that works continuously with water and land and animal and plant nations and consent and diplomacy to create worlds, to create shared worlds. 
Prior to contact with white people, it's estimated that North America was home to 60 to 400 million beavers. That is three to five beavers for every kilometer of stream or river. That is a beaver in nearly every headwater stream in North America. Biologists call the beaver a keystone species, a species so important to an ecosystem that without it, the ecosystem would collapse a species that continually creates habitats and food sources for other beings, families that filter and purify water, clans that replenish the soil with nutrients, communities that manage spring floods and water temperatures, a nation that continually gives. A beaver dam, a blockade, life-giving, generative, affirmative, a world building place governed by deep relationality, an expansive, fantastical sharing of space, a network of life-generating blockades that built and maintained the ecosystems that Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee, for instance, lived as a part of for thousands and thousands of years. Nibwa Kewen. Today, in our thinking through this idea of a blockade together, I'm gonna to try to deepen our understandings by sharing with you two beaver stories. Indigenous peoples have always been intellectual and artistic peoples. We always have had theory, meaning, philosophy, and aesthetic principles. And these were not individual pursuits. They were communal making practices. Everyone had their own stories, their own songs, and their own voice. And those things were considered and celebrated and woven together into collective understandings and meaning. Storytelling is a practice of deep relationality, not a looking at, but a looking with, or a looking through, or a thinking through together. Stories are a world-making process. This first story is an ancient Anishinaabe story, and it takes place a long, long time ago in the time of the very first beaver dam, in the time where beavers were giant, beavers roughly the size of black bears. Anishinaabe thought takes an expansive view of gender. We have more than two genders. We have a diversity of gender, sexual and relationship orientations, which I've written about in As We Have Always Done. And in my work, I want to continue to refuse that colonial gender binary, the cis heteronormativity, and I want to recenter Anishinaabe queer normativity. So in the following story, both the main character, uh, Nokomis, uh, which is a grandparent, and Nana Bush will use they, them pronouns. So here's the first story. Call out culture is exhausting, and no one knows this better than giant beaver and Nana Bush. These two have been trading witty and not so witty barbs back and forth all over the country, and it's been so long neither of them can remember what the original fight was about. But oh, did they ever both get a spike in followers. Nanabush have been stalking giant beaver around the internet for months before they lost their trail completely. It took a few days of consulting with their followers to figure out if Nanabush had been blocked or if giant beaver had shut down all of their accounts and disappeared from the internet completely. When it was decided that it was the latter and all that was left was the quiet, Nanabush also logged off and went back to the land with Nokomis to find solace. Nokomis set their net in the narrows between the two lakes, Ngitchigaming, which you might know as Lake Superior, and Adawagaming, which you might know as Lake Huron. They built a lodge made out of saplings and bark and lined with cedar branches. They wove mats out of cattails for sleeping. They ate grouse for dinner, made mint and cedar tea, and picked medicine and it till it was time to check their nets. Then Nokomis tried to teach Nanabush how to smoke whitefish. Nanabush was pretty busy, though, reading a lot of books because they were studying for their comprehensive exams, and that is no joke, at least in certain contexts. Things were going along pretty good for these two, so good, in fact, that Nanabush even considered shutting down their socials for good. Nanabush and Nokomis were so relaxed, in fact, they didn't notice it happening at first. 
Small incremental change can be like that, but each day the water level was rising ever so slightly. Nana Bush knew immediately that Giant Beaver was back online under fake accounts causing trouble. Nokomis knew immediately that Giant Beaver had dammed the head of the lake and was still building. Nana Bush fired up Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram. Nokomis found the dam. Nana Bush clicked, posted, retweeted, and regrammed. Nokomis sat on top. Nanabush memed. Nokomis waited. Nanabush serendipity style typed AMIK1 and opened all of Giant Beaver's accounts. Nokomis waited. Nanabush opened all the platforms, screen after screen after screen, finger on delete. Nokomis waited. Nanabush deleted each post seconds after they appeared. Nokomis waited. Nanabush deleted. Giant Beaver burst through. Nokomis grabbed onto their tail and held on. Nokomis hung on for two days through the night and past exhaustion, through the day and past pain, and when they couldn't hold on any longer, giant beaver burst free, drilling through the dam to break away. Nokomis felt like a complete failure, a fraud of a Nokomis. Nanabush rubbed their back. Nokomis looked up and saw Giant Beaver's dam blasted apart, forming the spectacular 30,000 islands in Georgian Bay, or Adawa Wikwidong. Giant Beaver headed east through Kina Gichi and Nishnabek Oguming and was gently carried by Gichi Zibi to the ocean. Nanabush ran after them, but it was too late, so Nanabush called out, I want to be your friend. Giant Beaver stopped, thought, considered. And then Giant Beaver returned to Nanabush and Nokomis to figure out how they could use their beaver skills for good, which they did. And all it required was a little patience, a little resistance, some community, and a considerable reduction in the size of a mick to the one we know and love today. Nibwa Kewen. In my culture, spring is the time for fasting, and my people will often fast in ceremony alone in the bush for four days and four nights. And this next beaver story that I want to share with you today is a fasting story. When Uiji Wagen decided to fast, they planned for these particular challenges years in advance. They practiced. They did the things they had been taught to do regularly, even though, even though. And so when the day came, Nokomis put the charcoal on their face in the Anishinaabe way and they began. Now, it isn't ethically appropriate to speak specifically about our practice of fasting or what happened in this particular fast, other than to repeat what those who have gone before me have said. John Benesi, from what is now known as Fort William First Nation, told this story to William Jones, and it was originally published in 1919, known as, quote, the woman who married a beaver, unquote. William Jones was a Meskwaki anthropologist, and he recorded many Ojibwe stories from the Western part of our territory in our language. In Kakage Benesi's published and translated version of the story, he says that during the fast, the faster, which today we will call Wijiwagan, meaning partner or companion, met a person who invited them to their home. Wijiwagan agreed. The home was beautiful, food and clothing were plentiful, and in time, Ouija Wagen consented to becoming this person's partner. When everyone agreed and the decision to be together was made, Ouija Wagen lost all memories of their parents and their previous life. These two had a beautiful life together. They had four children, and the family was able to meet its needs through hard work. They had lots to eat. Things were good. Now, Ouija Wagon's partner would sometimes leave their home for periods of time and go visiting. Sometimes they would take the children, sometimes they would go alone. Always they came back with beautiful and useful gifts, tobacco, clothing, kettles, knives, and bowls. Sometimes friends would come and visit their lodge too, but they never came inside. 
at some point in the relationship, as happens in all long-term relationships, Wijiwagan became aware that their partner was not exactly the same as them in body, mind, and spirit. I believe we've all had this sort of experience, but at this point in time for Wijiwagan, they realized that they had entered into a relationship, a partnership with a beaver, Amek. Now let's revisit that previous paragraph in light of this new knowledge that Wijiwagan is in a relationship with a beaver. Wijiwagan's beaver partner would sometimes leave their home for periods of time to go visiting. Sometimes they would take the children, sometimes they would go alone. Always they came back with beautiful and useful gifts, tobacco, clothing, kettles, knives, and bowls. Sometimes friends would come and visit their lodge too, but they never entered. In a national bay when it's obvious what is happening here, but it's not so obvious in a Western worldview, so allow me to explain. In a national bay when the spiritual world is alive and influencing, and it's really the main event, the physical world, which we're living in and inhabiting today, is sort of a detritus for what happens in the spiritual world. When the beaver goes away to visit, they are being hunted by the Anishinaabe. They are consenting to give up their bodies to help the Anishinaabe feed their families. When they return, they have been killed in the physical world and the gifts they are bringing, the tobacco, the clothing, kettles, knives, and bowls, are gifts of reciprocity from the Anishinaabe. This is an ethical exchange because the beaver does not have to give up their life. They do so with consent. The gifts are an expression of international diplomacy between the Anishinaabe and the beaver. Towards the end of Amik's life, Amik asked Wijiwagan to speak to the visiting one the next time they came by so that they could return to the human world. Wijiwagan did, and they returned to the Anishinaabe. Wijiwagan shared their story of a life with Amik and asked the Anishinaabe to respect their relation. This is such an interesting story for me with a layered and complex intelligence embedded in it. My Turtle Mountain Ojibwe colleague and friend Heidi Giwedenong Benesik Stark has written a wonderful paper about this story called Respect, Responsibility, and Renewal, the Foundations of Anishinaabe Treaty Making in the United States and Canada. This story takes place during a very prosperous time for both the Beaver Nation and the Anishinaabe. When we visit each other regularly, we gifted the beavers with our most precious belongings and the beavers gifted the Anishinaabe with their lives in the human world so we could feed our families. You see, there are worlds on top of worlds, underneath worlds, worlds entwined with worlds, sort of Anishinaabe string theory. There is an intricate ongoing reciprocity here practiced between individuals, families, nations that is facilitated by visiting. Heidi also argues, and I would agree that this story, quote, recounts the forging and functioning of a treaty relationship between Anishinaabe and the beavers, end quote. Anishinaabe responsibilities include tobacco, gifts, returning the bones of the beavers to water to renew the treaty, and speaking out to protect beaver habitats and worlds when necessary. The beavers, in turn, give up their lives in the human world and then return to the beaver world. Both nations lived without want. Both nations valued the practice of consent, sharing, care, sovereignty, and self-determination. Both nations shared time, space, water, and land. Let's think back to Giant Beaver for a second in that first blockade, and let's just appreciate how generative it was. It was a generative refusal. Let's just give thanks to Nokomis and Nanabush for not arresting Giant Beaver, destroying the blockade, and go, going back to business as usual. Nibwakewen. So today I've shared two Anishinaabe beaver stories with you, two stories that embody Nibwakewin, the practice of wisdom, two stories that animate Anishinaabe world-making potentials and generate theoretical interventions into my world. That first story 
with giant beaver is one of imbalance, persistence, diplomacy, and a generated consensus. The person who married a beaver grounds us in an expansive understanding of gender and instruct us, instructs us on consent, the political economy between Nishinaabe and beavers, and demonstrates a world made out of deep reciprocity, diplomacy, and respect. We have some choices to make. One can stand beside the pile of sticks, blocking the flow of the river, and complain about inconveniences, or one can sit beside the pond and witness the beaver's life-giving brilliance. We can take this understanding with us the next time we encounter water protectors in Minnesota, putting their bodies on the land to stop line three, or when we witness huge mobilizations like Standing Rock, again, putting communities of people between the land and the oil industry. Blockades are both a negation and an affirmation an affirmation of a different political economy, a world built upon a different set of relationships and ethics, an affirmation of life. So that, um, that presentation today is um, a shorter version of a longer piece of work also called The Short History of Blockade, which um, is a short book. And there are four beaver stories in that book. So if you're interested in, in um, thinking alongside me for a little bit longer, you can, you can find that book. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for listening. And I'm looking forward to visiting and, and all of your questions. I I can't hear the applause I imagine is it uh isn't uh happening right now in the uh audience. Um thank you so much. That was really, really amazing. You got me thinking of a a, a time uh I was I hadn't thought about this in a really, really long time, but in grad school, we went on this like field trip to the California uh, State Water Project and like some of the infrastructure they have like just uh, south of Sacramento. And the guy who worked at the State Water Resource Control Board just kept complaining about beavers uh, mm. and was making jokes about how he, him and his friends would go out and like shoot beavers and like they were like in the interest, right, of like California state water infrastructure. I hadn't thought about that in like 10 years. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it made me like recollect like, oh, how, beavers within the context of our water infrastructure here in California. Uh, thank you so much. That was really amazing. Uh, folks in the audience, if you have any questions or comments uh, for our speaker, you are welcome to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. I'll keep track of those. Uh, and if you're watching on Facebook, uh, feel free uh, to put your questions or comments uh, online, and I will also keep track of those. Uh, next up, we're going to hear a faculty response uh, from my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Kacha Rizling baldi uh, who will respond to the presentation that we just heard today. Uh, Dr. Kutcher Risling baldi is an associate professor and department chair of Native American Studies at Cal Poly Humboldt. Her research is focused on indigenous feminisms, California Indians, environmental justice, and decolonization. Her book, We Are Dancing For You, Native Feminisms and the Revitalization of Women's Coming of Age Ceremonies was awarded the best first book in Native American and Indigenous Studies uh, at the 2019 Native American Indigenous Studies Association Conference. Dr. Risling Baldi is Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk, an enrolled member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe in Northern California. In 2007, Dr. Risling Baldi co-founded the Native Women's Collective, a nonprofit organization that supports the continued revitalization of Native American arts and culture. Uh, I'll turn it over to, to you two and uh, we'll enjoy the conversation you all have. Awesome, thank you so much, uh, Caitlin. Really happy to be here with uh, Leanne Simpson, who, I mean, kind of a joke earlier where I was like, if I have to do a faculty response, can I just make a list of all the things I really like about Leanne Simpson? Um, because I do have that list and I can just sort of like read through it if people want to know. Um, I will say that I'm just, I'm really honored that uh, she would agree to come and speak with us uh, via our speaker series, but also because I know that much of her work and the ways in which we are able to engage through decolonizing methodologies here at Cal Poly Humboldt um, and some of the classes that we teach have really relied on 
a, a voice, a, an indigenous woman's voice like Leanne Simpson um, and her, her work with land as pedagogy and her work with understanding the things that we have always done and brought to the table as indigenous peoples. And I think it helps as I'm able to introduce this work to students for them to see a voice that is doing what they would like to do and is speaking in a way that they would like to, the things that they would like to talk about and seeing a space in all of the different things that they wanna do once they move through higher education uh, for them. And I think that that's probably one of the most powerful things I can say about being able to introduce these texts is giving students a vision for the, the value and the, the intervention that comes from indigenous peoples and places. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read uh, uh, Dr. Simpson's work, I will say the other thing that I think, two things. One is she's also a poet. And, um, and so she's a novelist, she's a poet, and the, the poetry is really meaningful and important, I think, for demonstrating how we as indigenous peoples uh, span what we think of when we think of what makes knowledge and what, what do we need to do and put out into the world and whether that's strictly some kind of academic writing and narrative, or if it's also poetry and it's also um, song and it's also other things. So on top of being a poet though, very, very funny. And I think that uh, sometimes the, the humor is, is, shouldn't be as surprising as it is, but it's really helpful when you're reading through sometimes some like really deep and meaningful things you're trying to connect with as an academic in a higher education institution. And there's just this humor and I think that that's also really helpful for people to be uh, to be given permission to be funny when talking about things. Um, and I know this because I <laughs> I had to write a book review. I was assigned a book review of one of Dr. Simpson's um, books, and I was reading it on an airplane uh, next to a guy who actually was watching Fox News at the time, and he was like watching Fox News and setting up all his stuff. And then he looked over and he's like, "What are you reading about?" And then I was just like, I'm actually reading about functionally why women shouldn't be forced to wear skirts and ceremony uh, in native cultures. And then he just kind of looked at me. I was like, you know, and like land return and stuff. And then he stopped talking to me for the rest of the flight. And I just kept laughing to myself reading this poetry and the, the discussions and the short essays. Um, I remember there was one that talked about like Kate Middleton. And I was just like, this is an amazing way of bridging all the ways that we try to teach and tell story. So I highly encourage people to take a look at the work because there's also this, always this kind of, this, this layer of what we bring to the way we do this work, which is a, a kind of resistance through, like a trickster resistance, a way in which we're also demonstrating that humor can really chip away and take apart colonialism in a key way because it, makes it pushes it into the realm of the ridiculous and then makes it pretty obvious that it's kind of a ridiculous state of which to accept as if it's supposed to exist in the first place. Um, and so I wanted to say that to start because I just wanna encourage people to continue to look into her work. One of the really foundational um, essays for me has always been land is pedagogy through the decolonization journal. Uh, I think that I would, highly encourage people to look into that as well, because it really is a great introduction to what we think about when we think about what are we doing when we're teaching, when we're engaging students, when we're like engaging ourselves in how we learn and what that means for us. Um, I wrote down a few things uh, from the talk today that I wanted to kind of touch base upon. So I'm Hoopa Yurikin Karuk, and I'm enrolled in the Hoopa Valley Tribe here in Northern California. And I thought a little bit about, especially beaver, uh, when we're talking about beaver stories, but the ties between the ways that we've seen people talk about beavers and the ways that then we in this area also talk about salmon. Because salmon for us is like really a keystone species, but is not just connected to the health of the environment, but the health of the people. And I find it really important to kind of think about the connections between our ongoing movements and resistance and the ways in which our more than human relatives have consistently modeled for us that resistance is meaningful and that it is, it's sometimes considered as small as 
whatever it is that you're feeling like doing, like I'm going to build this thing here. Maybe it's an inconvenience, but maybe it makes a difference. And when we think about as we're building movements, a lot of the times people will say that small thing you're doing isn't going to make a difference. But what we see is all of those small things are what become uh, larger like moments of resistance that have been built over a long period of time. Um, so I started to look in specifically to beavers a little bit. And I will say that um, it's very interesting for our area because we didn't, we're considered relatively late in the colonization cycle in Northern California, where we didn't really have uh, the influx of the Spanish. They did stop in the area, but they kept going. Um, and where we primarily get our very first set of sort of invasion by uh, settlers is through the expeditions that were looking for beaver pelts uh, in the 1800s. And that's where you first see people coming into the area. And for us in like the Hoopa, uh, Yurok area, that was a man by the name of Jedediah Smith, who actually was working as part of this large beaver pelt hunting industry, uh, coming into the area trying to find ways by which to like work with tribal peoples, and he really wanted just as many beaver pelts as he could get, and he kept going, and I think what you see throughout sort of Northern California is this initial uh, like obsession with beaver uh, because of what had been happening uh, in the north and then up in Canada. And so they make their way into this area. And it isn't really, that's like around 1828, but it isn't really until the gold rush that you see people start to settle in the region to start what is the attempted genocide of California Indian peoples. However, stories about beaver traders are never positive. They're never like everybody was really nice to each other and wanted to trade well. Um, and so there, I think what it really demonstrated for the peoples of this region is that they needed to be really um, like on the forefront of how they were gonna respond to what was happening to people coming in from other areas. Along the way though, I think beavers themselves were constant resistors to what was happening and the changes in their environment. And you get a lot of stories that are told by people where suddenly they were like, we used to see beavers here in this area and we don't see them here anymore. And the assumption was that that had to do with the hunting practices, but later they would learn that the beaver family had moved or they had decided to go someplace else. And then they'd say, and then they would come back. And so they were, I think they were well aware of what was happening and going on. And they were thinking about like the negotiating process of what was going on historically. But I will also say, we do keep track of this, my friends and I, have a fantastic colleague um, who I work with sometimes and she loves to keep track of what she calls like more than human relative ongoing resistance to the carceral state. And she talks about how uh, like more than human relatives, animals are constantly resisting the carceral state and colonization in really meaningful ways. And she loves to keep track of when that happens. And she, her favorite example is that one day there was um, a police officer who was like, trying to go out and stop people from doing something in the woods. Um, and he parked his car, but by the time he came back, this black bear had jumped out of a tree and beat the crap out of his car and broke all of his windows and then like looked at him and walked off. And she was like, resist, like resist, like always resist. And I think that that's a really important moment to kind of consider because I think what indigenous peoples try to remind people is like, we're not the only ones living here. We're not the only ones creating policy, law, or, or ideas. We're not the only ones with um, experiences or responses to what's happening. And when we consider that in how we develop anything that we're making, we ask ourselves the questions, but what about the fish? What about the beavers? What about the trees? What about the water? What does that mean for us as peoples that we have to also make sure that we are in consideration of our more than human relatives. Um, so in Hoopa territory, when we're talking uh, a lot about beavers, we, we call them the chwa, we say chwa, uh, that's like a beaver. Um, but what I think is really great is that we also see them as incredibly interconnected to the work that we are constantly thinking about with salmon because they really rely on each other. And I think beavers are, beavers are also really demonstrative of long-term and thoughtful process planning of what infrastructure is supposed to be and what it looks like and how it functions within an environment. 
And so I did some like preliminary research on beavers in California. And the thing that I found most interesting was an article that was written uh, in the early 2000s about their debating whether or not they're going to try to reintroduce beavers into parts of California where they were completely not wiped out, but at least removed. They do exist in other areas, but they were sort of removed from certain areas and mostly because of agricultural industry that had come in and taken over and determined that beavers were pests to economic development. And so they had pushed them out of the region. And now people are having conversations. Do we reintroduce the beaver to these areas where they are supposed to be? Um, and the article begins with a farmer talking about how awful of a time he's having because the beavers keep showing up and taking apart things that he's making, moving things that he's putting in different places. And he's like, they're effectively um, like disrupting my business and my ability to operate here. And, and he's very like annoyed by this fact. Like, and he, and he says, they're just so annoying. They're like, they're just like annoying to me. And um, I don't know, I feel like that's a good message to send to all indigenous peoples, like be annoying, uh, be the person that's just like, no, I'm gonna keep bringing it up and having that conversation uh, and making sure that I'm constantly coming in and be like, no, we shouldn't do it that way. Um, and I wanna remind people of that because I really, what I wrote down is like this idea around what it means to, to really think about like, is the role of disruption, the role of challenging and the role of like making sure that we are building indigenous political systems that are challenging colonial systems. And I know, know that we can often get the message that constantly being in a position where you are challenging that which you are being asked to accept as, as peoples in your communities, uh, suddenly people are being told that's not what you're supposed to be doing. You're not supposed to teach people how to challenge systems. You're not supposed to teach people to be resistors. And that somehow we are doing something wrong when we are introducing to people that actually the power lies within our own continued resurgence of social and political practices that would not only challenge, but dismantle colonial institutions that are continuing practices that not only are threats to indigenous life and land and resurgence, but also our more than human relatives and our futures. And I think I want to encourage people not just to do more of Leanne Simpson's readings, but to remind ourselves as we're navigating these higher education institutions, federal government institutions, state institutions, that their initial response to constantly be like, you're, you're too much, you're, you're too much, you're way too much for what is happening. That that is of course a colonial response to that we must constantly resist the idea that somehow the logics of settler colonialism are, are, the, are set valued and we're supposed to find some way to like just work within that system rather than actually like the beaver, just continuing to push and push and push to be annoying. Um, and so I think that I took a lot of that away from what was talked about today and some of my own research. And I just wanted to read one last thing um, for a couple of people, just in case, like I said, you haven't uh, been able to touch base with a lot of Leanne Simpson's work. I pulled out a couple of quick quotes that I hope will inspire you today to turn around and buy all eight books and more. Um, the first is, uh, we are from a people that have been forced to give up everything. And we have this one opportunity to give something to ourselves and we're going to take it. We are fucking taking it. Even though occupation anxiety has worn our self-worth down to frayed wires, even though there is risk. After all, everything we are afraid of has already happened. Um, so I, I wanted to put that quote out there. I also wanted to say, um, Another quote that I really rely on from Dr. Simpson, storytelling is an important process for visioning, imagining, critiquing the social space around us and ultimately challenging the colonial norms fraught in our daily lives and encouraging people to think about the stories that you want to tell and knowing that there are people who have done this work to show you that those stories are really important and they really matter. And that the storytelling is the start of a visionary process that is going to build the next world. 
And I'll say this, I, I have learned this in Hoopa. Um, in Hoopa, when we say uh, that you're going to sing or you're going to like do um, like a, a song and you're going to raise up a song, we say, Yana Ahwa. And that means like I'm singing, I'm raising a song, I'm introducing a song to a ceremonial dance, like I'm, I'm doing this thing, I'm telling this story. But that same word, Yana Ahwa, is used to mean raising up a prayer to heal someone who is sick. The medicine person raises up their hands toward the creator and the sickness is taken away. And I think that we need to always keep that in mind and how we, how we participate in these processes, how we raise up our voices, our stories, our songs, and they're all prayers. They're all prayers for how the world is going to be, could be, uh, will be, because we as indigenous peoples, we are the people who know a time before colonialism. We have lived it, felt it, We've told stories about it. We've dreamed about it. We remember it. We visit it when we think about ourselves in ceremony. We, this is the time before colonialism, which means that we understand this time as very short and that there will be a time after colonialism. And when you wanna know, how do I know what that world could be? You look to indigenous people's stories and forethought, visions and songs, prayers, they're the ones we're the ones that can help you to see a world after. And that's, I think, why we remain such a threat to the state, because we are the ones with the liberatory imaginative practices that can build that next world with everyone. So again, that's my plug, my presentation, my response. I just want to say if, um, if anybody's interested, please, please just like pick up all the books uh, but I highly recommend, as we have always done, I assign that to students quite often. Um, and I think that it's an amazing way to kind of get a sense of what it means. Uh, also, it will really work well to convince you to get off Twitter. Um, and so I think that that's also a really amazing kind of thing to start to think about what does this mean for how we engage in the work that we're doing right now. Uh, but thank you, everyone. In, um, Hoopa, what we say is, we don't, I asked my grandpa, I said, how do you say thank you in Hoopa? And he goes, Hoopas don't say thank you. Uh, so this is actually true. We don't have like an actual word that means thank you. Um, what we do have is what we say is set dia, and that means um, I'm happy. Uh, and what you're sort of saying is that this thing that we've done, it, it actually made me feel something. It changed me in some way. It made me happy instead of the, what we say is passive, like, thank you. So in Hoopa, we say, set dia no huanghu alhalau, like I'm happy. Uh, so I am happy. I'm leaving here rejuvenated, happy. And I just want to thank you for everything. And I'm hoping that we get some time for question and answers uh, and an opportunity to kind of touch base about your ongoing thoughts and work. Uh, and I'll leave you with just an open space if there's anything that you'd like to add. So thank you. Wow, um, <laughs> Jimmy Guetch for for that deep, deep, um, thorough engagement with my work, and I think um, as a as an Indigenous scholar, that's exactly the sort of gift that I I've always um, I think I've always dreamed about. I don't even know if it's ever happened before where another indigenous scholar from, from a different place in a different nation sort of um, engages with my work, but then also thinks alongside me and, and takes it and makes it um, to a different different spot. So I, I feel that was really, really meaningful. And, and thank you for, for doing all the, the thinking and the labor. And um, also thank you so much for we are dancing for you that's a really really incredible book and i hope everybody who is on the zoom and on facebook goes and reads that it's such a, a crucial book for indigenous youth and for visioning new worlds and so um, i'm really thankful for that book as well and i'm really excited to just um continue this thinking alongside and visiting and um excited to to get to the questions that folks might have i'm happy to sort of answer whatever I can answer. Yeah. I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, thank you both. That was amazing. Uh, Kutcha, some folks on Facebook would like you to paste uh, the quotes you read uh, into the chat, uh, if you don't mind doing that. Um, 
you got me thinking I wanted to share some of my favorite quotes too. So I pulled just a couple, I pulled short ones, uh, ones that I really like and uh, I think about all the time. Uh, these are from As We Have Always Done. Uh, settler colonialism as a structure necessarily has to shift and adapt in order to meet the insatiable need of the state for land and resources. The processes of colonialism don't necessarily look and feel the same every time, but we can't be tricked. Uh, I love, I always, I love that one. It makes me <laughs> smile and giggle inside. Uh, and uh, the last, I'll just share one more short one. Uh, my ancestors didn't accumulate capital. They accumulated networks of meaningful, deep, fluid, intimate, collective, and individual relationships of trust. Uh, I, I, I love that one so much. Um, folks who uh, are in the audience, please feel free to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Folks on Facebook, you'll use the comment section. Um, I wanted to share first, uh, Chance Carpenter offered us some language of, of indigenous refusal um, in response to thinking about the resistance of our, our more than human relatives. Um, the first question I'm going to ask is from uh, Michelle Napoli. Michelle, thanks for your question. Uh, any further thoughts about intertribal protocols of ethics and consent uh, where this has been broken down and there are shared spaces? I like to think of shared spaces as, as spaces that are, are really dense in terms of, of dense and rich in terms of possibilities and as, as really important sites of knowledge generation. And so um, there's areas of overlap um, in my homeland, in Michisagik homeland that we share with the Ganagihaga and the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And while I think the foundations of our culture are very similar, um, a lot of times the way that we live, those, um, those practices are different. And Anishinaabe people always go around the circle for instance, we follow the sun and the Haudenosaunee go around the circle in the opposite way. And so if you have a very rigid kind of dogmatic um, protocol rule kind of based way of embodying those traditions, you can get into a lot of conflict really, really fast because you get into a fight about which way we're going to go around the circle. Um, but what I think that I've learned um, over the years of watching different elders navigate this is that it's most important that everyone at the circle is coming with their best selves, that um, that we're doing the, the peacemaking and diplomacy work, um, the, the work of sharing, the work of nurturing those deep relationships. And it doesn't matter so much the way that we go around the circle when we gather in these shared spaces. Um, and so I think that that has been um, really important to me in terms of understanding how to wear these teachings and how to um, keep that kind of fluidity around them so that they adapt. And it really, I think, emphasizes the, um, the practice of care and of gentleness that I see in a lot of different Indigenous cultures. Um, particularly when we're working inside Indigenous communities. So I think um, these spots are opportunities for lots of sharing, for lots of discussion, for thinking about what you can give up in order to promote the peace, um, for thinking about what you can give up in order to continue to bring forth more life. And I think that... Um, I think that solving those differences and working through, seeing through those, those conflicts are an important part of sort of any kind of relationship. Um, we can't sort of abandon relationships um, the first side of, of a road bump. So I think that um, that diversity that our peoples, that our families, that individuals, that different nations, that different communities have in terms of our practices and our ethics, um, I think that that's, that's rich. And that makes us stronger. And I think if we have um, communication skills and uh, intent and we, we go in with kindness and, and care, we can find ways of um, strengthening those relationships and using those protocols and practices to strengthen the relationships rather than to kind of wear them down and to um, make people feel like maybe they, sh they don't belong in the circle. So thank you for that question. That was, that's a great question. Uh, our next question is, uh, um, 
how I'm going to ask how you uh, uh, do these things, but how do you balance kind of anger and outrage um, uh, and still being hopeful and positive uh, in <laughs> looking forward? Right. I mean, perhaps that uh, participant would like some advice on some of the strategies you use. Well, I think. First of all, I think that anger and outrage oftentimes is the right emotion. That's the healthy emotion. Our peoples um, have lived through tremendous violence, um, tremendous injustice. There's tremendous violence and injustice all around us in the world today. And I think that the appropriate emotional response to that is outrage and anger. And I think that part of colonialism has been, and this has been a very gendered process to sort of restrict um, and uh, moderate what kinds of emotional expressions are allowed or, or permittable in, in settler society. And so I think Indigenous peoples um, have the, the right and the responsibility to full, feel the full range of human emotions. In my own work, I think anger, um, I think, was one of the motivators for, for books like As We Have Always Done the anger and the outrage. So one of the things that I do, I run through it and I also write through it. I try to be careful not to get stuck in it because sometimes when it, you get stuck in it, um, you can cause a lot of harm in your family and in your community. You can cause a lot of harm to yourself. Um, I try to organize and struggle through it because I think when you start to come together um, in ways where you're addressing the sort of issue, even if it's in a small way, um, it's a way of putting that anger to work. Um, and then in terms of hopefulness and positivity, I feel like oftentimes when I give a talk like this, there will be some non-Indigenous person that says, well, what gives you hope in the world? <laughs> and I was like, why am I to have one to have to have a hope? Like you guys have like destroyed things here <laughs> and you've destroyed my community and my life and my land. And now you want me to feel hopeful. And then a few years ago, um, when I was working on the book with Robin Maynard, Rehearsals for Living, I was reading a lot of black abolition feminists and I was reading Miriam Kaba and Miriam Kaba talks about how hope is a practice. And so it's a practice where you you get up every day and even if you don't feel hopeful, you look for those cracks in the sidewalk, you look for those um, cracks in the system of settler colonialism where you can you can kind of burst through and where you can build and where you can make. And that really resonated for me um, because I don't often feel hopeful as an emotion, but um, I do think it's important to be able to dream and vision beyond our current circumstances. Um, because if I, I think if we lose that ability to dream and vision beyond what our life looks like right now, then we scale down our kind of anti-colonial, decolonial dreams. And I think we should be scaling up right now because the whole thing is 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 falling apart as our ancestors predicted. So yeah, sometimes I just don't feel hopeless. I mean, I just don't feel hope and I just don't feel positive. And uh, I give my per myself permission to to feel those things. Yeah, thank you for that insightful reflection. Uh, we have a student in the audience that has their hand raised. Uh, so Philip, I'm going to like hit a button and hopefully you'll be able to ask your question uh, that way. Uh, we'll see if it works. Um, oh, you're, oh, uh, oh, never mind. Uh, your hand is no longer. Okay, I'm going to hit the button. And we'll see if, uh, if you still have your question. Uh, you should be able to ask it in just a second. No, I accidentally pressed it, but I would like to say thank you <laughs> for the talk today. It's been super enlightening. And um, what you just said uh, about leaning into the anger and not letting yourself, like, like letting it motivate you to still do positive work. I'm really liking that transference capacity there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think a lot of great work comes out from like being petty. I wanna like write back against <laughs> this scholar who said something really messed up about a particular uh, subject. And I think that's, Okay. <laughs> uh, I see Michelle also has her um, uh, hand up. So Michelle, I'm gonna hit the same button. 
uh, and you should be able to, oh, you lowered it. So if you do have a question, uh, raise it back up and I can let you ask that. Uh, I don't, if folks are hitting it accidentally, I don't wanna put them on the spot. Um, I have a question that I'd like to ask, and since I'm moderating the q and I'm going to take that, that luxury. Um, one of the things I love from Landa's pedagogy is uh, kind of what you lay out at the very beginning of the essay of like, if we want to build leaders uh, thinking in our Indigenous thought uh, philosophies and governance structures, um, why would we send them to K through 12? institutions where they learn Columbus discovers America and they're forced to say the Pledge of Allegiance and how you so eloquently say, right, state educational systems are designed to produce populations of people willing to uphold settler colonialism. Uh, I find myself as an indigenous academic at a Western institution, right? Uh, the heart of whiteness, right? As indigenizing the academy uh, says. Um, and I, I think there's kind of this, moment we're in where TEK is like becoming a cool buzzword uh, for institutions to to jump behind right and like thinking about ways uh, to uh, integrate indigenous knowledge systems and we uh, our university actually transitioned to a polytech institution uh, a couple years ago and as soon or excuse me last year uh, and as soon as we saw the announcement we in the Native American Studies Department we all started joking of like oh they misspelled it they meant polytech <laughs> like PK, right um, and then some of the kind of just our community right thinking through some of these issues of like well what does this really mean for Native nations that the university wants to like begin to incorporate indigenous knowledge systems, uh, traditional ecological knowledge into the institution, into the curriculum. And like one of our concerns was like, oh, they're gonna use TEK in their marketing material. And meanwhile, indigenous students aren't even gonna be able to get into the institution. Um, or you know uh, afford the tuition you know a long laundry list of ways in which indigenous peoples might actually be excluded right um and so uh as and i do think right the institution needs to rely on tek that's how we're going to get out of climate crisis uh, and like we need to start treating indigenous knowledge systems as equals if not superior to uh <laughs> western sciences and i um as a young, I'm not tenured yet, uh, and I was just wondering, like, thoughts or advice on how how you navigate, right, these these inst these colonial institutional spaces, right, um, and like how you make sure your your knowledge systems are are treated ethically, and um, yeah, that's kind of what I'm what I'm thinking about. It feels like a scramble, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. What's so interesting, Caitlin, is when I was a PhD student at the University of Manitoba, like 100 years ago, like 1995 to 1997, I was studying um, because traditional ecological knowledge was a new buzzword. It was new in the academy. It was coming out of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. There was like a big... <laughs> A big it was a big thing all of a sudden that indigenous people had knowledge like what and maybe that knowledge was going to be useful to the environment crazy and so it's interesting to hear that like an echo of that coming up again now and what was happening at the time was it was it was very quickly as neoliberalism does um makes it makes this idea that indigenous peoples have knowledge um makes it a, a resource so so quickly and so what happened very quickly was that um the academy and governments in Canada were very good at separating the knowledge from the people so they would they would document it um from elders they would translate it into English they would remove the kind of world views remove the ethics remove the politics remove the spirituality because scientists can't deal with that um, and then they would focus on sort of this data level because we have this long um, body of knowledge um, gained from living in a particular place and having an intimate relationship with plants and animals for so long um, that fit into the Western scientific kind of worldview. And so what happened very quickly was the knowledge was rendered like virtually useless and it was becoming, it became a, almost a commodity that would just... Um, was being used to 
um, maintain the status quo. And so that's always the danger. And I think um, that's something that I could have, I made a choice. <laughs> I this, When you said, sometimes you have to be petty. Um, <laughs> I made a choice not to sort of just engage in that debate the whole time, but kind of pivot and I left the academy to do this and just show kind of the breadth and the brilliance of, of indigenous knowledge. Um, then I think the second answer to that is, is my work at the Dechinta Center for Research and Learning, which is a post-secondary education program uh, in the north in Benende, which is in the Northwest Territories of Canada. And um, our post-secondary education program is a land-based program. So we take um, Dene students or Indigenous students from the North in a small class, seven to 10 at a time, out on the land for five or six weeks with elders. We live together in community following Dene law um, in canvas tents, um, eating together, living together. The largest um, barrier to post-secondary education in the North for Indigenous women is childcare. So our program is family-centered and people bring their kids and we have a land-based program for the kids so they learn alongside us. We spend half of the day engaged in things like high tanning, um, making dry fish, fishing nets, making medicines, making things with elders, and then half the day sort of deepening our understandings of what we're learning from the land within a kind of Indigenous studies context. Um, the second part of the project is sort of using the resources that we're able to um, raise through, through funding proposals and redistributing that in the community level to keep people on the land. So hiring harvesters to harvest food for the community and distribute it in the, in the community um, as a way of connecting young hunters and trappers and harvesters to elders and building that body of indigenous knowledge. And so that work has become really important um, to me. And I think um, it's sort of an echo in a way of, of Landa's pedagogy because it's in a different nation where I'm a visitor, but um, the Anishinaabe part, I think comes through in, in Landa's pedagogy. Um, yeah, so I think there's I think there's lots of different ways of doing that, but I think um, traditional ecological knowledge can't be separated from the politics and from the sort of violence of colonialism from the 500 years of having the state, you know, destroy that knowledge system. It's got to um, you've got to you've got to include indigenous peoples and respect our homelands. Um, and respect to our um, responsibility to govern ourselves in order to be able to to get at that knowledge, right? It's not a, a resource to sort of um, be uh, extracted from us and used to propel climate catastrophe. Right. And I, I often think about like, it wasn't that long ago that like TEK was criminalized, right? There are still mm -hmm. aspects of that, mm -hmm. which native peoples, right, get threatened with lawsuits or citations yeah. or like required to have permits from a bureaucratic state, right? And so like to, on the ground, right, Indigenous people still experience threats of violence right for yeah. practicing TEK and then for a institution of higher education to really like capitalize and market on that right um and so yeah it's 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 challenging right to to think about how we begin to integrate other knowledge systems ethically right in these institutions that historically are relied on the extraction of, of native yeah. bodies whether that's bones and anthropology buildings right or belief systems and knowledges um I want to thank you so much for that amazing presentation. I think really generative uh, discussion. And I, I'm just so psyched that we uh, got Dr. Simpson to close out our Decolonizing Sustainability Speaker Series. Uh, we did it, everybody. Uh, this was the last <laughs> session of our Decolonizing Sustainability Speaker Series for the fall of 2022. Thank you for coming, everyone, to all of our sessions. We appreciate it so much. Uh, the recording of today's sessions available on the Cal Poly Humboldt Native American Studies Facebook page. Uh, the link should be at the, the top of your chat window. You'll need to scroll up away 
displays, uh, but it's pretty easy to find us uh, and it will be available soon on our YouTube channel. Uh, we appreciate your support of our Decolonizing Sustainability Speaker Series, and please stay tuned uh, for our series next semester. Uh, we hope you all have a restful winter break, uh, and we'll see you all again in the new year. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.